All right, are we live? Uh, You're live. Lost. All right, welcome to this evening's meeting of the War and Astronomical Society. I'm Bob Trimble, your vice president, taking uh, filling in for Diane Hall, who is feeling under the weather. And uh, so I will I'll give my office a report right now. Uh, so I've got uh, I've got an opening for a talk in September. If anybody would like to give a long talk, uh, that would be awesome. Um, Jeff McLeod will be giving a talk in uh, October, a short talk about simulating spiral galaxies. So that's pretty darn interesting. Um, if anybody would like to give a talk, uh, there's plenty of topics out there. Give me a give me a con con contact. Um, so I will turn this over to Riyad Mahdi, the uh, second VP. What do we got going out at the observatory, Riyadh? Um, in our last uh, open house on July 23rd, uh, we started out about 6 uh, 53 p.m. Uh, we started out with a little bit kind of uh, mostly uh, hazy and some clouds. There was there were some some uh, holes in the clouds as well. Um, we had about 14 people that attended, including members and general public. Um, we did open the observatory, uh, the eight-inch refractor. We used that to observe uh, a few double stars and a um, couple of um, deep sky objects as well. Um, uh, we also uh, looked at the uh, the DAB, uh, the 22-inch Dobsonian, uh, to see what we can do in terms of cleaning the optics. So we met to, to discuss that a little bit. Um, and um, next uh, open house will be, uh, of course, our picnic, August 27th. It... Oh, we lost Riyadh. We locked. Ah, okay, well, give him a few seconds here. Wonders of the internet. All right, well, I think we get Riyadh got most of it in. Yeah, as you mentioned, our picnic is uh, the 27th. Um, uh, Later on tonight, I'd like to get a head count from people to see how many people are interested in going to the picnic. We, we may or may not have to revise things as uh, as things go. So um, so on to our next report. Let's go to the secretary, Mark Kedzier. Hi, good evening, everyone. Now, you might notice this groovy thing I got in my eye. I got some uh, contact, uh, had not cataract surgery. So uh, after I'm through wearing this guard, this will serve as a uh, a pasta noodle strainer uh, so I can multi-purpose with it. And hopefully my vision is improved from like Bortle 7 to Bortle 3 at least. So, but I, I already noticed a difference on it. So this is my observing eye too. So I'm I'm looking forward to it. Uh, other than that, I uh, have nothing to report. Hope to see everybody at the picnic. All righty. Thank you, Mark. All right, Adrian Bradley, treasurer. Is he? Yeah, you're still here. He's on the road. Yep, I'm here. There he is. Um, yeah, I'll, video may or may not be advisable, but I'll try. Um, so the the report's pretty simple. We're still looking at we're in around thirty thousand, um, in our bank account. Uh, PayPal is still, I think, roughly thirteen hundred. So we're still doing we're doing pretty good with cash. We had at least we had at least one membership renewal come in this month. Um, as far as GLAC, um, GLAC has received our donation as well as a couple of other donations from member clubs. So we are GLAC is in position to finish paying for one of the big tent, the tents, we're going to have two tents at Astronomy at the Beach. So at this point, we've corrected the PayPal um, donation tag on Astronomy at the Beach. So was members, if you would like to donate personally, you can now do so through PayPal. We set it up very similar to the way the was PayPal is set up. I just so, put a link to the GLAC donation PayPal in the in the chat. So. Yeah, it, changed away. From, it changed from the uh, original one I set up was a personal one and PayPal deduced that we were using it for a nonprofit and shut it down. And I re so I created a business one 
and PayPal is saying you guys are good now and you're in business. So, so that works. And um, other than that, we like to also support astronomy at the beach. Astronomical League, really quick, I'll cover that for you, Bob. Um, Astronomical League had Alcon 2022. Um, our own David Levy, as well as myself, presented at Alcon 2022 remotely. Um, it was a pretty big success. They had uh, help with, um, with doing online uh, presentations. So it was a hybrid conference. They met at Albuquerque in um, Albuquerque, in New Mexico. And so next year's Alcon, um, I think Alcon.org, you'll be able to see where the next Alcon is. And there is another Alcon live coming up soon with a uh, with a talk. I don't I don't have it in front of me, so I invite you all to those of you that are astronomy astronomy league members, um, feel free to check it out. If you are not getting the Reflector magazine, let me know, and I'll verify. We verified that everyone that I sent in last month or the month before. Um, was indeed renewed as an astro astronomical league member. So we should be getting the reflector. And if you would like to, you can go to AL alcon.org to log in to the site and become a member on the site. Free. It's um, there's no additional charge. Um, and as we put in all of the uh, was newsletters, subscribing for astronomy magazine or for um sky and telescope there's directions there so i think i've hogged the mic long enough bob back to you all righty so i put a, a a link to not the ones that adrian said because i'm still looking for that one but uh uh they asked a, a list of astronomical league conventions in in the chat so uh publications dale teamy okay well the the WASP is online as per usual. And um, apart from that, a couple of things I have going right now. Uh, one, we're working on the uh, 2023 calendar and uh, August 31st is the deadline for any uh, photos or images to be sent in for consideration. So I remind you know, our astrophotographers out there, if they have extra pictures to send in, they better get on the ball and do it. Um, we're also working on a makeover of the uh, website and moving it to uh, a host that we'd be paying for ourselves instead of depending on the goodwill of one of our members to carry the burden of the cost. So that's an on ongoing project as well. Back to you, Bob. All right, thank you. I've uh, posted a link to our latest uh, newsletter in the chat. Back over to here. and lost what I had up there. I got way too many windows open. And let's see, uh, Outreach, is Kevin here? Kevin is not here. So um, I know that we are having some issues with, uh, with Cranbrook. Um, We'll have to, if Kevin comes on later, we'll have him give his report. So that is officer reports. Um, Bob, uh, yes? real quick, I have something for outreach. What do you um, got? Uh, tomorrow, um, I have a group of, uh, it's like a youth organization um, attending, a, I think they may be like a church, church group um, attending at Stargate and I will be there tomorrow between 8 30 9 o'clock to give them a presentation and to um, open the dome for them if it's clear awesome has anybody else done any outreach that they, they'd like to report on in the last two weeks no okay uh, Pravid and i as always are a part of local boy adrian your connection's lousy <laughs> Uh oh, can you guys hear me? Barely. 
You're dropping out yeah. for me anyway. Yeah, my phone connections are tenuous. But, um, yeah, and, of course, I keep speaking for you, David. Um, we can't wait to hear your uh, observing report. I'm sure that'll come soon. Um, but we we do it every week. Global Star Party had the uh, 102nd edition, and David and I were there to uh, give presentations. And um, as far as other outreach, um, there will be more coming from some of the other clubs that I'm a member of. But so I've I've given a couple of talks, and I've been uh, scheduled to give a few more talks here in the coming coming year. So um, I haven't I haven't documented those very well. So I'll yes, if, if you guys do give talks, make sure you make sure you let our, our outreach guy know about that. And I see Jim. Yeah. Shedlowski, you need to unmute. He's been trying to say something. Yeah. Uh, hi, Jim. You got to unmute. No, good. Can't hear you. There you go. Oh, there you go. Yeah. I gave uh, my, the presentation I gave to the uh, Cranbrook meeting last September in search of the dark universe. I gave that same presentation to the lowbrows here a couple of weeks ago. Nice. Okay, so special interest groups. Uh, we have any special interest groups? Uh, double star. You'd, uh, re yeah, did so, you, you need double stars. Yeah, we've been actually doing uh, really well uh, the last uh, few um, couple of months or so. Um, even though it's been kind of cloudy, but whenever we've had a chance and while we're at the observatory, uh, usually, especially when it's uh, kind of hazy and hard to see uh, much of deep sky objects, the one thing that does a lot of times come through would be uh, the brighter uh, double stars. So we've been we've been doing that, um, and we'll continue to uh, to observe them, of course, uh, at our open houses. All right, I am going to share that. Can everybody see what I'm sharing there? The sun. Uh, well, that's yeah. I see the sun. Take a look at that. The sun is really active. That uh, that one, not, wow. That one. That we're one not, uh, sunspot group in the in the lower part of the hemisphere. We're actually not, we're seeing, not seeing it. You're not. Okay, no. hold on. Yeah, oh. you got it on the other. It's on uh, the other stop. screen. Stop. Rearrange videos on stage. Share. I'll do the screen rather than the app. How's that? Yeah. Uh, very oh, right. So yeah, take a take a look at the low, the lower hemisphere. That that one. Look at that. Blam. That thing yep. is just going nuts, and this this is the thing that uh, spit out that CME that's hitting us now. And I'm I'm seeing yep. reports of possible aurora as far south as like New York and stuff. So, yep, the sun's very exciting right now. Yep. I had an interesting evening the other night also um, on observing. I took my little telescope out, my Vixen, and uh, my next door neighbor is from Japan. He is here on a work thing and his parents came in and uh, I went outside and it was just clear enough. And what I did was I took the telescope up. They'd never looked through a telescope before. Get and out. I, That's cool. cool. And, and I had trained it on, uh, on Saturn, which was rising at the time. I love and, first timers. And I uh, put it in the, their view and I used a, it's an 80 millimeter uh, Vixen and I had a five millimeter lens on it actually on purpose. And it just showed up like huge and they went, whoa! And one of the the uh, the father of the the the, of the, the kids uh, goes in there, and he goes he goes around to the front of the telescope to see if it's like painted on the front or something like that. <laughs> How did that to you? What is it? Was, with that? It was <laughs> fabulous. It was great. And uh, and then I put it on Mizar and Alcor so they could see a double star, and that was kind of cool. And I wanted to go to Albira, but it was straight overhead. And uh, it just was too much to to bother with. But uh, and there was a uh, five four year old little boy, which is sharp as a tack, there. And I put him on a little uh, stand there, and he looked through, and he saw Saturn. And he said, "That's got ring around it, like that four year old, right?" So we got another one starting out. Nice coming up. It was it was it was a lot of fun to do, and it, for people that don't do that, you know, I thought that that was kind of a kind of a blast and we also showed them earlier in the day the moon the sun sun had three spots on it that day and it's still kind of uh kind of 
bedazzled them. You know, they said, how many are there? Three. You know, it was very cool. So Yeah, I've been in my, in my weekly reports I've been doing for the VO. The, the Suns had like at least five spots yeah. every week and or more. And it's just it's just crazy. Yeah, I so can. I know that David wants to uh, say something. So, yeah, we'll go the, with him. Take the stage, David. Yes. Thank you very much. I wanted to begin with an observing report that we almost didn't have last night. I went to our little children's group, which Wendy and I called the Vale Astronomy Unclub. And uh, it was threatening, lightning and thunder and axes falling from the sky. <laughs> I got there and there were a couple of people and I thought this is good. I'll be able to do a little quote and a little speech. But within half an hour, we had 55 people there, all kids <laughs> and all wanting to hear about astronomy. It was wonderful. Awesome. No stars, no nothing. But it was so much fun. For my poetry quote today, it's the middle of summer and we're all having the air conditioning on. But I really need to go to Robert Service's famous poem, The Cremation of Sam McGee. I'm not sure how many of you know it. I know that my late father-in-law was very, very fond of it. My uncle had memorized the entire poem, which took takes over half an hour to recite, and he recited it for us. My dad loved it, my grandfather loved it, and I love it. And it's about a guy named Sam McGee who wants to go to the Klondike and search for gold. But he can't stand the cold weather, and he knows he's gonna die. And he tells the writer of the poem, when I die, I want you to cremate me and promise me. And the writer promises him. And so he dies and he takes him, he takes the body for days and days until he finds this ship locked in the ice called the Alice May. <coughs> Excuse me. Anyway, he um, builds a makeshift crematorium, lights the fire and stuffs the remains of Sam McGee into it. And here's where I pick up at the end of the poem. I do not know how long in the snow I wrestled with grisly fear, but the stars came out and they danced about ere again I ventured near. I was sick with dread, but I bravely said, I'll just take a look inside. I guess he's cooked and it's time I looked. Then the door I opened wide. And there sat Sam looking cool and calm in the heart of the furnace roar. And he wore a smile you could see a mile, and he said, please close that door. It's fine in here, but I greatly fear you'll let in the cold and storm. Since I left Plum Tree down in Tennessee, it's the first time I've been warned. Oh, come on, all of you know this. Why don't you read it with me? There are strange things done in the midnight sun by the men who moil for gold. The Arctic trails have their secret tales that will make your blood run cold. The Northern Lights have seen queer sights, but the queerest they ever did see was that night on the marge of Lac La Barge, I cremated Sam McGee. Thank you, back to you, Bob. Thank you, David. All right, any other observing reports? My granddaughter saw the moon and, and told my daughter about it, so that's pretty cool. Actually, when, when my granddaughter, my two-year-old granddaughter sees anything round, it's the moon now, and anything, doesn't matter what it is, so. Oh, yeah. Um, my, my wife, set, my, my, my daughter and son-in-law set up one of those projectors that put stars on the ceiling, and she was like, I got stars, and she fell asleep just repeating that over and over, so that just makes me very happy can make an astronomer of her yet. So any any observing reports? What have you guys seen? Well, Anybody set up scopes and seen anything? Oh, I, well, uh, I know Riyadh has. And... <laughs> I was Went asking who had Cuxin. seen the Perseids. Anybody seen the Perseids? Yep. I haven't seen them. Any, any, any uh, uh, better, worse than the last time? I saw quite a few of them when we were at the Adirondack Astronomy Retreat. There were, it was the Delta Aquarid Maximum, but about about a third of them were early Perseids. It was great. We had a wonderful week out there. Four out of six nights were clear. That was probably a week that you guys had clear sky as well. And while I'm yakking here, I just wanted to call to your attention 
that at the end of September, there will be an Arizona deep sky star party, a deep sky Arizona closing optional, no, the deep sky star party at uh, Oracle State Park. And uh, the last time we did this, we had five clear nights. So um, if you want to, uh, if you're interested in it, why don't you visit the um, Explore Alliance website or Explore Scientific website, and you can hear all about that. Hope to see some of you there. Thanks. I uh, this is not not necessarily an observing report. Let's see if I can find uh, the link here. Uh, I found out that about. I'm posting this in chat. This is a NASA mission. Uh, called Sunrise. It is a multi-telescope interfer space telescope interferometer uh, CubeSats meant to look at the sun. And I thought that was pretty cool. So I asked the question on Twitter when I saw this, uh, was, is there, are, are there any um, interfer space telescope interferometers looking for exoplanets and life? And somebody responded, here, take a look at the life space mission, which I also posted in chat there. That is a, a space-based interferometer that uh, is going to be looking for exoplanets. Uh, I thought that was pretty cool. So interferometers are on the way. Just thought that was some interesting news to share. So, um, let's see, it is almost eight o'clock. Any other observing reports from anybody? So I don't know if you guys can hear me. I posted in the chat. Um, it's probably more of an outreach thing, but Point Obart Lighthouse Park, which I've uh, I'm finished a kind of a coffee table book of their lighthouse at night. I'll be selling a few of those. They've agreed to, at some point in the future, do an astronomy night at the lighthouse. Wow. So... They were looking, I was wearing the lowbrow hat, um, and they asked about um, doing some sort of night where people came with telescopes, looked at the skies. And um, I said, absolutely. And it would be something I would invite those who were near to the area. David, I'd have to remote you in. Um, but uh, you're talking skies that are similar to, if not sl slightly darker than Port Crescent State Park's dark skies. Um, it's a little hidden gem along the thumb, and I'd be more than happy to lead that effort. I'll have to talk to Kevin about it, and I don't know if there's time to do it this year because people are going to star parties and such, but um, but we're talking next, uh, possibly next year, even if we set it up for roughly a year from now to do some sort of outreach event there. I think it would be great. So I'm going to follow up with them on dates and and I'll I'll lead that effort because that lighthouse is near and dear to my heart. So that's, I posted uh, I posted a link to that uh, lighthouse uh, website in chat, and uh, I, I just posted another link in chat. This is the Keweenaw Mountain Lodge. A lot of you know I went to Michigan Tech, and I, I, re I return to the Copper Country quite frequently for uh, visits. Keweenaw Mountain Lodge is way north in uh, near Copper Harbor. Beautiful place, and they uh, they they've just gotten a uh, IDA dark sky designation, and. Um, they're hosting uh, uh, astrophotography events. Uh, I, I would actually like to see clubs in Michigan do something with them because inexplicably there's no astronomy club up there. But um, yeah, it, it's gorgeous up there and uh, they are doing something. So I think I'll follow up with them. I, I would like to see us do something up there. Although it's, it's a long drive. It's beautiful up there. Oh, Bob. There's something else I wanted to mention. Every week, I think I told you this last time, on Facebook, I think I do put on a thing called mm -hmm. Astronomy of the Week. And we're starting to get uh, more and more people that are actually uh, watching it, you know, and uh, some don't mention anything, but they tell me that they see it each week. And right now I'm doing constellations every week. And um, uh, earlier I did stars and then some nebula and such. But this is starting to really pick up... Um, 
uh, popularity. I use a lot of the stuff from the from the Sky Safari. Uh, some of their writings are just fabulous. And uh, then I take the pictures off off the internet, put it in there, and they uh, there. And we did. I did one on the James Webb telescope a couple of weeks ago when they started uh, showing those photographs. And uh, boy, the, the response was incredible. We had about forty responses on it, which was really great. Boy, I'm telling you that that James Webb. I am. I am. I'm on Twitter a lot, and I, can't I wait. am following i am i every day i am following new researchers that are using the james webb so uh, there, there was a post on twitter the other day that said james webb is looking at this particular galaxy and somebody posted a hubble picture of it and about five minutes later the guy that was using the james webb posted a a, a rather unprocessed picture of what he was looking at i'm like this is freaking amazing and we're getting five minutes we're getting stuff from from the james webb that, that's just, just astounding it's, it's it really is unbelievable even even the thing when somebody said well did you know he's giving me one of these things did i know anyway he says uh, that this one picture is taking a grain of sand at arm's length right that that, that early one that they did and that's the part of the sky that it's doing I said, D I didn't know that. No, just kidding. <laughs> but it was, uh, but they're starting to pick up on it. And I think the James Webb is going to increase interest in astronomy again. I really do believe that's going to be a, a big set for us because we're getting to see things like we've never seen before. Just fabulous. Well, the other big thing that's going on that's, I don't think it's getting nearly as much press as it should is the Artemis launch. That sucker's rolling out to the pad. And again, yeah. I, I'm seeing. Uh, picture of that that thing out there that's going to supposed to go up what no sooner than the 29th so right. uh, i'm sure people are going to be watching that but i'm just not seeing the excitement about artemis right now i, I don't what's anybody's opinion I, I i'm okay i'm seeing some excitement i'm not seeing the crazed excitement i was seeing with the spacex launches and they might need to do something about that because they've been pretty good about their media stuff. But I don't know. Um, our Artemis, I saw a cartoon <laughs> on Twitter is Artemis, and people are saying, Oh, look, it's the moon rocket. The next frame is, I can't wait to watch it land on the moon. And somebody's saying, You want to tell them or you want me to? Because <laughs> it's not landing on the moon. But then again, somebody said, Seven of the eleven Apollos didn't go to the moon either. So, but anyway, I don't, I don't know what people's opinion of Artemis are, but the costs are pretty darn expensive per rocket, and nothing is reusable. And I'm I'm seeing the breakneck speed with which SpaceX is putting stuff up now. I have issues with some of the things Elon Musk has been doing, but his rockets are freaking amazing. And um, I'm not, I don't know if Artemis is going to survive. I just don't. Well, anybody else have an opinion on that? I have something I wanted to add that uh, JWST is now informally known as the just wonderful space. <laughs> it sure <laughs> is. Just to just to talk, Bob, regarding yep. your your question, you know, uh, back back in the day, way back when, fifty years ago, it, uh, things were really unique. Today, it's becoming old hat, and I think that's part of the Artemis's problem. It's not going to be man's. It's big rocket, but we've seen big rockets, and and Musk is doing some spectacular things, like landing the the stages. Uh, and 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 photographing them and so on and so forth. So and fairings now, and fairings now. Yeah, and next month or next uh, next uh, in a few weeks here, I'll tell you a little bit more about what's been going on with uh, uh, SpaceX and a few others. So for the next month's uh, uh, Cranbrook meeting. All right, well, it is 8 o'clock or close enough. This is usually when we have a, a break for 20 or so minutes and uh, continue to do what we're doing right now and just talk about astronomy and space science. But go have a bio break. Go get, go get some of the munch, refill your coffee, and come on back in about 20 minutes.
or stay here and talk about astronomy and space science. Hey, one other comment, Bob. What do you got? I know here uh, the, about Artemis. Uh, Musk has been uh, is is pretty much just about ready to launch his big one, the the uh, Starmax, I think, or is it called Starmax? I'm not even sure what it's called, but I, I've seen pictures of the, the breakneck speed with which they're building the uh, launch pad and tower. Well, it's ready. It's ready to be uh, tested. That's crazy. To see, and if it if it is successful, it will be even larger than Artemis as far as capacity <laughs> to put uh, uh, to put payload into low Earth orbit. So it might, it, uh, you know, Artemis might get a one-upsmanship from Musk yet. I, yeah, that, that, that's been the problem because, you know, Artemis has been under development for how long now? A long time. And okay. SpaceX is just, they have just kept developing and kept developing. They have had a lot of failures and then they're having continuing successes and, uh, and, more and more countries now are making their own reusable rockets. So he's kind of like set the standard. And I, I really don't know how you justify a nearly $2 billion rocket every single launch. It's just yikes. I, I, I don't know how that works. I, my name's Paul. Uh, I, I'd say Artemis is is never gonna work unless they uh, build some kind of uh, biohabitat remotely on Mars, where they can get a reprieve from uh, uh, gravity. I, I don't know what the radiation effects are on humans on Mars are. But <laughs> bad. Bad. Mars uh, is a bad place. Uh, they, they probably have some some radiation uh, uh, protection. That's a, it's better than being in space. But uh, unless uh, I mean they, they, the, the the cost of sending sending humans over there is just uh, monumental. And they, 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 not until they they use CRISPR to design some <laughs> you know. New human bioengineer humans and, to be uh, well that they, and that's, and that's been a lot of science fiction about bioengineering humans to better survive in a in a space environment or bioengineering them to the point where they're not human anymore. So I'm not sure. But would you? I don't want to do that. But uh, well, you'll get some somebody to do it. I'm sure you would. <laughs> but yeah, so, so Artemis. Um, again, it it the. As far as I know, it's using repurposed shuttle engines and shuttle boosters, um, which is fine. But again, none of that is reusable. And uh, the Orion, the Orion capsule itself, um, God, it was pretty funny. I actually went to um, a, a NASA social down in uh, Columbus, Ohio, and uh, they were talking about the the uh, they were working on the Orion there, and all the pictures you see of the Orion, right? You've got the capsule and then you've got the service module in the back and you've got the, uh, the, uh, the solar panels hanging off of it. And the guy was saying, well, there's a fairing uh, underneath that. And I'm like, so you mean when it's in flight, actually that fairing is off and you're going to see the guts? He's like, yeah, all those pictures that you see with the fairing on, it's not going to look like that in flight. I'm like, okay, so they're make, they're make, all the pictures you see in flight are all pretty and it ain't, it ain't going to be. But uh, I, I said with I I I haven't seen. Uh, does Musk have any plans of making a moon rocket? It was that is was that his plan? He he's involved with the uh, with the lander that's going from the station around the moon and landing on on the moon. He's been contracted by. Uh, by NASA, so he is part of the program about landing on the moon. And I've seen I've seen so many posts the only recently lottery, about lottery game changer would be as if if there were precious metals on the moon or that uh, there's a 
rocket uh, satellite uh, that's going to that asteroid that uh, is supposed to the, be the Psyche uh, mission. Yeah, uh, a heavy metal uh, asteroid. Uh, whether or not they could robotically mine that and steer that to the to to a, to a moon colony, as far as that, I know, that would have to be. You know, they found a uh, an asteroid apparently recently, uh, in the last few days actually that that uh, has an enormous amount of gold, platinum, and many other precious metals on it. A new uh, one, or, or you're not talking Psyche area? What's that? You're not talking Psyche area. No. This is a new one? I think that's the name of it. Maybe it is Psyche. Is that it? I don't well, know. That, that's the one that they discovered around Venus. I just saw uh, published in Science. Venus? Yeah, but that's not the yeah. one we're talking about. That's not the, no, it's a different one. Uh, you know, like I said, don't get me started on Elon Musk. But, um, all uh, right. I just posted a NASA thing on uh, ISRU, in situ resource utilization. And yeah, there, there are minerals on the moon uh, that uh, we could process and make into fuel and stuff like that. Truly. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, well, uh, the water, there's a lot of water built up water. Yep. in the regolith and stuff. Plenty of water. But my, my biggest problem with Elon Musk is this, uh, this communications thing of 45,000. Spacecraft. Uh, I'm I'm really skeptical about that. It's for the greater good. It, yeah, what you think? Uh, well, no, but you know uh, what he, that, that you know one what line. He, and then his remark said, uh, "Well, we don't need to photograph things from Earth. We could, we can, we need to do the photographing from space." Like okay, said, like, and all the space telescopes are now your responsibility. Thank right. you. So we can all go up there and do it with it with into space as soon as we can put the money together. So. You know, that's my problem with Elon. Elon is about Elon. He isn't about us. Sorry. All right. So apparently I'm, I'm looking at that slide I posted. My There's problem. several missions uh, looking for resources on the moon. So we just got to we just got to find them. I'm, I'm sure we're going to find them. Good. I just think we could do it better with robotics, but I don't want to get started about that again. <laughs> like like it or not, NASA is consciously trying to uh, commercialize uh, the exploitation of space. So of course, they, you know that is an it's a, it's and a Musk, Musk is the is the what, one of those that is taking advantage of it in yep. a big way. The of thing course. is, yeah, I think Musk can do it faster than NASA. I mean, I, I you know I've always groused about when I was a child and the Apollo program and I'm so slow. I don't put another rocket up, put another rocket up. And now Musk is putting another rocket up, and I'm like, whoa, man, slow down. Are you sure this is safe? <laughs> I, <was> like, <laughs> I don't know. If, if he hits the forty-five thousand, we're going to be in a lot of you know. Well, how how about the Jeff Bezos, who has uh, spent. He just signed a contract for eighty-three billion dollars for a number of launches with three different companies. None of them are SpaceX, by the way. Right. To uh, to launch his his fleet or his constellation of over seven thousand satellites in competition with Starlink. Oh, great! That's all we need. So now we're going to have 50, now we're going to have uh, fifty thousand uh, spacecraft. Well, if if we're lucky, there'll only be fifty thousand. It could be a hundred, two hundred thousand. That means every but, time you look up, you're going to get to see one. Hey, you're stealing my thunder from next month's presentation. Yeah, I get it. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know you, but uh, Jim, you know my attitude about that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, I love I love our our thing, and they don't. They want to just make money off of it. That's all. So, all right, it's okay. What are you going to do? So I, uh, I said I, every week I, I do this post for the Vatican Observatory and I go to Facebook, the solar observing group, and I find a picture that somebody's posted and somebody posted an absolutely gorgeous picture of the sun they took and they used a Coronado Solar Max 3A double stack, I think it was. Really? So I went and looked that thing up and I'm like $3,900 and I'm like, ah, that's what I want. <laughs> I mean, my wife is like, no, but, but babe. Nobody has to explain to all of us how, how buying telescopes goes. You buy your oh, first one and then you want to get one 
bigger, <laughs> then you want to get another one. Oh bigger. God! <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, we we go to the uh, our made of flea market, and every every other time we go there, there's a telescope. I'm like, no, I don't want to buy that telescope. No, no, it's somebody else's old telescope. I'm not going to buy that. Yeah. All right. Well, I want to get it. I want to get a replacement for my what 22 year old Dob now. Oh really? Okay. Cool. Well, my 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 eight inch my eight inch is showing its age, and uh, the the new uh, I want to get a ten inch, and the the newer Dobbs have uh larger larger eyepieces, you know, four oh, four prong rather than three prong cool. for the secondary. Okay. They're just better all around. Yeah. You get to bring oh, in a lot of be. those satellites they're putting up. <laughs> you get to bring in. <laughs> uh, I like my. You know, I'm telling you, I've been I've. The, the, the best telescope I ever purchased, I did not the biggest and not the most expensive, was this uh, refractor, this Vixen. You just throw it in the car and you just drive out there and you put it up. It takes you two minutes to do and it does everything you want. That's uh, what I'm it. looking for when it comes to outreach. I mean, I, I had one of those uh, solar telescopes that you had to hook up to a battery oh, yeah, and yeah, stuff. Yeah. Uh, it was a pain in the butt. I want something you can set up. And do observing. Well, you know, get you, out there and do observing. And if you want to yeah. do a little bit more, uh, you, instead of you get it, I've got the eighty millimeter. Uh, you get the one hundred and five, which is even a little bit more powerful and such. But if you'd have just looked through at Saturn through that that eight that uh, that eighty millimeter, it was spectacular. It was it was all you'd ever want. And you could even see a couple of the moons too, which was really nice. cool too. And. Uh, and you could even see a couple of the moons too, which was really nice. cool too. And uh, and I, it, it just you throw it in your car and you take it with you. That's what you do, you know. I have Stop. a question. Have, have any an of you guys uh, use moon filters? Oh yeah, sometimes. I just I just, uh, I just came back from uh, Highlands International Dark Sky Park in Emmett County up north. Okay. It was awesome there but the thing was the moon was so bright yeah i wasn't you have sure it. if i needed a moon filter because i'm looking through the eyepiece with this eye and then this eye is in the dark sky park for over an hour and a half right so when i stop mm -hmm. looking at the moon i have a spot in this eye got, now well they've got some really <laughs> you put those you put those filters on on the eyepiece itself they screw right in and they'll okay. skim, that, skim that thing for you, and they're available on they're available through Sky and Telescope and through um, through Astronomy Magazine. You can get them uh, very save easily. your eyesight. Yeah. yeah, so they actually they actually work really well. Oh yeah, yeah, they're wonderful. They really are. Yeah, what they, kind of scope do you have? Because some telescopes have uh, a cover on them that oh, yeah. have a little circular thing that you can pull off and right. just I... let some light through. Yeah. I have a uh, I have a Dob. It's a Celestron, um, but it's a Dobsonian. Okay. Yeah. Well, to take, to, to, does the cover have a, a circular thing in the center of it that comes off, or yes. does the whole? It does. It that has a the part that just is like the spot where the the light refracts. Well, uh, I'll wait a minute. take the whole cup off. Wait. Uh, because you can, uh, that that cover. Yeah. If you just take the center portion out that blocks most of the light of the moon so that acts like a moon filter right like there so but you could try that but yeah moon filters work great they, okay. they, they save your eyesight yeah, yeah. Cause the, the moon is <laughs> moon can be really freaking bright especially on on large scopes i mean god when the when the was has our what 20 some odd inch dob out and we don't have a moon filter on it's like oh it looked like i was looking into yeah. the sun <laughs> Bob, it looked like I was looking right into the sun, man. It was crazy. Yeah, yeah you got it. You got it. You got to either block that light down or use a moon filter. Oh, for sure. And it was weird because um, I've never, well, actually, I've been to a dark sky park. I've been to the one in uh, Port Crescent. But um, this one in uh, Mackinac City was way better. I mean. Yeah, the, there it is. That's, that's, the that's, that's, the, that's the cover. And that's the center portion you can take out, and that's for observing the moon. Oh, very very nice. And all the all the telescopes you can get them for all the telescopes. Just that thing, and that cuts down the light coming in. Yep. And it, it's it's best for moon moon observing. Yep. Really a good thing. Nice. You can actually use it for solar observing too. You put a solar lens on here too, if you want to, which cuts it down a little bit also, and still you get to see what you want to see. Okay. okay. There you go. All right. 
Oh, I see our speaker is on. Hi, Tony. Nope. So, <laughs> the tech check is successful. Hi there. <laughs> well, my day job, I actually work for WebEx, so the tech check better work. <laughs> <laughs> you bet. So, Tony, what, what's your what's your opinion on Artemis? Um, considering the last time I saw it, I was 10 feet away from it. I'm very looking forward to seeing it off the pad. I could show you some pictures if you like to. I was actually at rollout down in, um, really? Yeah. Down in, um, a show, um, which I very much miss going to new Orleans. That was, that was awfully cool to see. Pull up some of those pictures. I can share those. As I, am, well. I am embarrassed to say I have not seen a launch yet. And me, of all people, space freak, rocket freak, I have not seen a launch. I, I have seen that. more Atlas V launches than shuttle or, or anything else. I've yet to see a SpaceX launch. And I think that might be in part because I'm trying to avoid SpaceX fans. Their rockets are so much cooler than their fans. <laughs> but that's a, another topic. Better discussed over a, a nice frosty malted beverage. I have had some very interesting conversations with Brother Guy over coffee about some historic astronomers who have just been... Gut, gut bust, busting, laughing. Brother Guy, the um, the Jesuit priest. He's my boss, man. No way. Yeah. I'd love to meet him. Oh, he's 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 he 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 is the nicest man on the planet, I and know. I credit him with saving my life because I was a very disgruntled Windows IT tech support guy, oh, and I, I just started you. doing website stuff, and uh, yeah, he 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 came to my wife and I house after being in rome and he uh -huh. wanted he wanted a chili dog and a verners because he couldn't <laughs> fit that so we got him a chili dog and a verners and he said so i got this website which was awful at the time and i said well we don't have a blog component to it and i really want to uh, do a blog and i'm like you know that's what i do right and he's like no i'm like a week, a week later i we i had a, a blog up for him and he's, like, he's like how would you like to blog about astronomy and space science with me and i'm like <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, so, sit at the feet and learn. Yeah, that's awesome. But yeah, he's 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 he. I I've known him for thirty years. He's a he's a real big science fiction fan. We have a uh -huh. huge group of mutual friends in the science fiction community, and he goes to science fiction conventions. He knows awesome. all the local Michigan science fiction fans. It's, it's crazy. Okay. I did not know he was in Michigan. Now, no, well, he's not. He's not. He's uh, he's okay. He's in. Glasgow today. He he caught COVID, by the way, on a train in Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, not happy, but he's in Glasgow remotely giving a presentation for the Meteoritical Society, and okay. he spends half his time in Rome and half his time in Tucson, where the Vatican right. Advanced Technology Telescope is on Mount Graham. Right. Where, so. where the where the hardware is, and I assume you mean the European Glasgow and not the Montana yes. Glasgow. Yes. 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 I have peeps in the in the Montana Glasgow. So we're well, heading I, up. We're heading up on two minutes before we have to start here. And actually, I have to take a bio break. So I will be right back, and then we will start our session up. So we do want to mention good. that Nicole Nichols passed away. You know. Yeah. Uh, what a bummer. Yeah. Last month. Uh, I will be right her. back. So that was that's too bad. That was sad. Uh, there's, I guess there's only three of them left. Isn't that right from the original Star Trek? Uh, that sounds right. Yeah, I think the che the guy played Chekhov, the guy played Sulu, and, uh, and right. uh, Kirk. The three of them. Mm -hmm. They're still Have you, you heard the story with her and Martin Luther King? No, I had not. I, I, I think I did some. Oh, go tell me. Go ahead. Yeah, so um, I, I've not had the opportunity to meet her, but she has been very very involved with a lot of the stem outreach uh work that nasa does especially with their nasa socials 
And um, I heard this story secondhand during one of those and have have since heard it um, repeated several, several times uh, around the time of her passing. But she was uh, a, a little bit dissatisfied with her role on Star Trek early, 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 early in the... Uh, I knew that, yeah. Uh, ...in the run and was at an event, I believe, in Los Angeles. And um, Dr. King was there. And the organizer of the event asked her to come over that Dr. King wanted to meet her. And she was, of course, enamored with that and was absolutely would have loved to to meet Dr. King. Went over, talked with him a little bit. Um, it, it was he and his wife there. And, you know, they got friendly, chatted a little bit. And he mentioned what a big fan he was of the show. She says, yeah, about that. Uh, I think after this first uh, run is done, this for season's done, I'm going to look at something out else um you know uh leave the show and do something else and, and he says oh no you 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 can't do that uh, I heard that you. is I the you. only show that he allowed his children to stay up and watch and you know got across to her that her being an officer on the bridge and essentially you know on equal footing with the the other officers there was so very important to to him and, and, you know, what, everything he was trying to do that, you know, he more or less begged her to stay on the show and she did. Yeah. She, she, um, and she, and she always, uh, 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 mentioned him as the reason she did stay on. Yep. Right. She did mention that, that was the I genesis her, of I that. Met her, I met her two, two, at two conventions and okay. uh, I got a chance to sit down with her for about, five minutes with my astronomy background, you know, and everything like oh, that. Oh, nice. And she yeah. was, uh, she was a, a, a lovely lady. She really was as, as <laughs> smart as they come to. And mm -hmm. uh, I'm one of those people that never missed any episode of any uh, people, Star Trek, any time ever. And I was <laughs> telling her about that. And she said, well, you know, there's going to be some more coming on. Is what she said, you know, these new ones that are out there now. And uh, she's a very, very nice lady. Very nicely. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, I love that picture of the original cast during the rollout of uh, the shuttle Enterprise. Yeah. In their essentially bell bottoms at the time. We got to remember this was the late seventies. Sure. <laughs> Greatest thing. Alrighty, so it is eight twenty-two. Uh, gonna get everybody get get back to your seats, and we'll start up in one minute. Ready to go, Tony? Sure. I got my slides. <laughs> All uh, right. How long I got? How many of these are am I gonna unhide? Uh well you got uh till you got an hour. Okay. So you got plenty of time. And yeah, I'm gonna after that and we sign off, if people want to keep talking, you can keep going. <laughs> awesome. All right, so it is 8.23. Welcome back. This is the Warren Astronomical Society. Our main speaker tonight is Tony Rice. He is an information security engineer uh, and Virginia Tech alumni working in telecommunications in, in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina. His career spanned various areas of research and development in software engineering, analytics, and information security. Tony speaks in area classrooms, museums, and libraries. He also helps broadcast meteorolo meteorologists across the country and share the night sky with their viewers. He's a frequent guest on local television news in Raleigh, North Carolina, discussing current NASA missions and astronomical phenomena, and has been known to hold impromptu sidewalk astronomy sessions. Wow, that's familiar. Uh, <laughs> with passerbys. His proudest moment so far is leading an event with the National Park Service at the Wright Brothers Memorial in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. Uh, for over 800 visitors on the space shuttle program leading to the launch of the final mission. He's, Tony is going to be talking about the engineering of the unfolding of the James Webb Space Telescope and why it is an amazing process. Tony, take it away. Thank you, sir. And actually, I'm going to expand on that uh, broadcast meteorologist thing a little bit because if anybody knows their local TV Mets, um, put me in touch with them because I, I love to, to build out my list. I got about 400 of them. Hey, did you know there's 400 TV meteorologists around the country? It's actually a lot more than that. I'm trying to get them all. But um, 
basically, I'm pretty passionate about that. Uh, have spoken at American Meteorological Society uh, conventions as well as the um, um, the National Weather Association, uh, where those broadcast Mets get together. The reason I'm passionate about it is, and I'm sure your club, uh, like my club here in Raleigh, and I also work with the, the club in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, just up the road, uh, we're, we're very passionate about outreach. We're very passionate about uh, bringing this science uh, and the, the uh, everything that's exciting about the night sky uh, out to the general public. And they, they often are a little bit overwhelmed by what we see here. So it can be a, a bit of a challenge. And that's what I, I find really, really cool and really, really nice about uh, being able to leverage our local broadcast Mets. Because if you think about it, you know, TV news is kind of on the downturn a little bit, but there's one segment that still is very, very popular, and that's the weather. You know, people tune in for the weather. If you think about it, most people on a daily basis don't get the opportunity to interact with a scientist. That's the one scientist that people see on a daily basis. So they're really carrying a heavy load when it comes to STEM outreach and that, that kind of thing. You know, Of course, their first uh, job is keeping people safe, um, is is dealing with uh, severe weather, but they're also the ones that get have to put on lots of different scientist hats. Um, good friend of mine uh, here in, in Raleigh used to work for the local NBC affiliate. Now works for um, NBC proper. He's their director of weather operations, and he tells all sorts of stories about how when we had an, an earthquake in up in Charlottesville, Virginia, uh, just to the uh, to the north uh, west of here, and then we had another one in. Um, in the northeastern part of, of North Carolina, I'm sorry, the northwestern part of North Carolina as well, that was felt here in Raleigh. Well, they get a, a microphone stuck in front of them and they have to explain what's going on science-wise. The point I'm trying to make there is they are the station scientists. What we can do um, as amateur astronomers is help them. They know that astronomy is something that their audiences absolutely eat up. Whatever they feed them, astronomy wise, they absolutely love. They see this on social media. They see this in the feedback that they get at the station. So that's what I do with them. I put out a, a weekly email that kind of summarizes what's coming up, what's worth making a big deal about, uh, and what is worth not even mentioning, uh, not overhyping, because that's one of the, uh, the things that I've seen in the media lately. You know, things like uh, close passes of asteroids that they make too big a deal about. Uh, we're experiencing that right now with the uh, that drives me nuts. Activity. Yeah, doesn't it though? It's always the British tabloids that really blow it out of proportion. Uh, but too many media sources here in the states pick that up. So um, I, I try to keep them on the straight and narrow there as as best I can. Now, right now we've got a, a CME heading our way, a coronal mass ejection. We had one that happened last night, um, peaked, you know, some of the geomagnetic storm measurements. Uh, overnight. Uh, and then there's another one heading this way. I got an email from a friend of mine that's at the NBC affiliate in Philadelphia. How do I report this? You know, what's a good map to show this? I said, you don't. Uh, mention that it's there, so you at least acknowledge it, but the peak of this storm is going to happen about four o'clock our time. Not a great time to go outside and look at Aurora. So yes, even if the Aurora were going to be happening over you, you know, know that you got to look at the details of this and uh, you know, understand what the uh, the possibilities are. So, you know, that's what I spend a lot of my time with is uh, working with those broadcast Mets. And again, I'm, I'm pretty passionate about it. So, have you got any contacts there? In uh, I, I know I have a couple in Detroit. Um, I want to say I have some elsewhere in Michigan. But if you know any of your local Mets, please send them my way. I'd love to add to the the roster there. Um, any, any comments on on outreach and? Um, and and things that you guys have seen as being pretty effective in uh, sharing the night sky with with well, uh, folks there. I, it's interesting you bringing up meteorologists because uh, in 2018 we had a bolide explode over Hamburg, mm -hmm. okay. and it was the meteorologists and their Doppler radar which were tracking the meteorite bits. Yeah. So they're good at finding those. They are, and and actually those fireballs. Um, it, when one of those happens, people lose their minds and think that it's a super rare event. I added to my weekly email just to get the point across that it is not that 
rare. Um, some tracking of that uh, to show that on a on any given week there are about a dozen um, ballpark uh, across the U.S. and usually for any given person, any given location in the U.S., there's usually about four that are visible in some way, shape, or form. You know, we get reports of it's a lot easier to get um, video now with all the, the video doorbells and um, dashboard cameras and things like that. So that's a, a big component of the reporting too. But let me jump into uh, our, our, our lovely web telescope here. I will do this and then I will do this. I'm at less of a disadvantage here because I'm not struggling through um zoom uh, i actually know webex fairly well for obvious reasons uh but i'm going to share one other you, you're going to learn i love tangents um <laughs> but i'm going to share one other tangent with you uh something that, that happened a couple of weeks back that i find absolutely fascinating so this came out about two or three weeks back uh hit the news it's something that was out there in the data and I think it went unnoticed. I'm not sure who noticed it first, but it it got a fair amount of run in the media. So the the Earth takes 24 hours to rotate, right? Actually, no. Um, here's since we've been recording this, since we've been monitoring this over the past about 50 years, and this is the responsibility of the U.S. Naval Observatory, uh, where the vice president lives, actually, uh, up in, in Washington D.C. on Embassy Row. Uh, it is their responsibility for measuring the rotational period of the Earth, and it varies from day to day to day. Now we're talking about variations of uh, fractions of a millisecond, but that's something that it's useful for uh, navigational purposes in the Navy. And the UN actually has a um, a division that um, that monitors these sorts of things and, and, and reports on it. But why this was interesting is on June 29th of 2022 was the shortest day in recorded history. It was uh, a, almost 1.6 milliseconds shorter than 24 hours. And why this is notable is over the past uh, certainly 50 years that we've been monitoring these things, and this is the zoom in of, of that data back to 2019. Here's the longer period uh, data. And I pulled all of this from the U.S. Naval Observatory website and, and pulled all that data down and generated this, this chart here. The blue line is a somewhat smooth version of that. You see how chaotic it is. And each one of those, there's 85,000 some points here over that 50-year um, period. Uh, and it varies day to day. There is a pattern over uh, the seasons where uh, the days get shorter and longer. Again, we're talking you know fractions of a millisecond. But uh, seasonal changes such as uh, the ebb and flow of, of ice and sea ice at the poles um, changes the, the distribution of, of mass, uh, particularly around the axes of the Earth. And that's going to change the, uh, the orbit, or not the orbital period, but the uh, rotational period. It, it, I just, I find this fascinating, but um, it, everybody focused on this shortest day, which is notable because... Everything above that horizontal line, well, that's a little bit longer of a day. Everything below is a little bit shorter of a line. So over time, days have been getting a little bit longer. And the reason for that has been primarily uh, the, uh, the, the tidal precession of the moon. The moon has been getting farther away by about four centimeters a year. For comparison, that's about how fast you're your um your fingernails grow just to give you something to uh to align it to uh and that continues to happen because of uh, tidal precession so to suddenly have it start getting faster i'm not entirely sure why and there's a couple of different theories and and they kind of all center around climate change so you know that's another fascinating topic for me to talk with my my meteorologist friends but um, the, the, the thing that I got out of this that fascinated me the most was we have down to the, I believe it was the, the, the resolution that the Naval Academy, I'm sorry, not, not the Naval Academy, the Naval Observatory uh, measures this to is the 10,000th of a millisecond. So, you know, pretty good resolution. Uh, down to that level, they have measured 
an exactly 24 hour day once. It was in 2008, July 19th, um, you know, down to that, all those zeros plus or minus on 24 hours. I just find this kind of stuff fascinating. So I, I wanted to share that. Uh, any comments before I move into the, the meat of what we were going to talk about here today with the web telescope? I, I thought that uh, the, the day was uh, 23 hours and 56 minutes. Now, keep in mind, there's different measurements of the day. The sidereal um, day is going to be measured by um, not the position of the moon in the sky, but uh, or the moon or the sun in the sky, but more of distant stars. So there's a couple different ways of measuring the length of day. But yeah, that's a good uh, point. I was going to ask, how do they measure that to such ridiculous resolution? Um, there's a, a, a couple of different tools that are available. One is that retro reflector that was left by the Apollo missions. Uh, Apollo 11 left one, and I think some of the other Apollo missions left some additional ones. Retro reflectors being reflectors that will always, whatever angle that you you hit it with, uh, will reflect directly back at you. Uh, you take uh, a laser fired at the um, at the moon, and uh, the speed of light is well known. You're able to measure distance. That's one way. Uh, one component of the of the measurements. Uh, I put a link in the chat to those retro reflectors if anybody wants to see them. Yeah, those things fascinate me. And, and keep in mind when when they were throwing those uh, experiments out on uh, Apollo Eleven, they did not have a whole lot of time. They were moving around the surface of the moon, a, a space about the size of a baseball diamond, the infield of a of a baseball diamond, and you know managed to get just some. Incredible, useful science that we still use today. That still blows my mind. Um, uh, I understand quasars are a part of it, and math is way beyond me. And um, there's a couple of specific stars that they're monitoring day to day to day. Um, again, to compare to uh, compare that sidereal day to the the rotational day. But yeah, good question. Other comments, questions. All right, let's jump into web. I'm gonna spend the bulk of the time talking about the engineering, because again, it fascinates me and I'm still amazed that this thing is out there a million miles away doing its thing at L2, and that it was successful. And you'll see a little bit, excuse me, more why uh, that is so amazing. But let's talk about the what. And this is a question I get, whether I'm talking to a school here in North Carolina, I do a lot with my, um, with my uh, my local public libraries here, it's a question I get over and over again. You know, why did we bother putting web out there? You know, why did we spend ten plus years putting this together and the expense and the engineering challenges when we've got the Hubble Space Telescope? And I'm, I've got a, a chart coming up in a moment that uh, will hopefully make that a little bit clearer when it comes to where all this sits in the electromagnetic spectrum. But the the goal here is quite a bit different than what um, the Hubble Space Telescope was put up there to do. It is really there to act as a time machine, and we're already seeing that happen. Um, it, it has blown away expectations even in those first couple of images, and I'll show you a few of those, but um, it is there to see the absolute earliest light. Uh, and we'll see where it fits in the electromagnetic magnetic spectrum. But when you think about the Webb telescope, please think about infrared light, because that's what it comes down to. Uh, that allows us to see that far back in time. I'll show you why in a moment. Uh, we're able to see through nebulae. We're able to see through the dust and the gas that's there that visible light will not penetrate, but infrared light absolutely will. So we can see behind um, these uh, clouds and, and, and dust, and uh, we're already able to see the water in uh, the atmospheres of exoplanets. So um, the, the story of Webb is very much about the infrared spectrum that it's looking in and also being able to see even deeper into some of those exoplanets. So this is the picture it was taken. Oh, this is at Northrop Grumman. So this is where um, the telescope was being built. Uh, last I saw um, 
web before launch was up at the Goddard Space Flight Center, where they were building some of the Starfinders, some of the uh, trackers uh, that were used for calibration and alignment and and things like that. And just the scope of this thing is amazing. It is so big. You'll you'll see it once I show you a couple of the videos of the steps in the unfolding, but um, scope wise, three story tall building and spread out over the size of a tennis court. So um, this is one that uh, I'm always happy to talk to uh, astronomy clubs because you get this. This is really hard to get across to even a high school audience and um, some of the public audiences in uh, libraries and things like that. Uh, we've all learned about the elect elect bleh, electromagnetic spectrum in the past, but I, I like this image here because it, it shows you just how thin the visible light spectrum is. And that's what we're working every day. Uh, that's what you're using with your, your telescopes, unless uh, there, there's somebody here who's got a radio telescope in their backyard or is doing some work with, uh, with infrared. Uh, for the most part, we're all working invisible. And it's such a narrow part of the spectrum. There's so much else out there to see. And yes, Hubble can see into the infrared. Uh, but as you see, you know, down here, in oops in this part right here it's just barely touching into the very near air infrared even that's produced some in really impressive things when we look at some of the images that come back from hubble but web is absolutely designed to go into those very short wavelengths i'm sorry very long wavelengths of light you know 600 to you know 2800 nanometers uh, i show spitzer up here as well and we'll look at some of the other space telescopes that's one of the things that uh, I think a lot of people don't realize is when you think space telescope, first you think Hubble, now we think James Webb. You might know about some of the others, Spitzer and, and some of the ones that are, are out there doing some of the exoplanet hunting. Um, but there's really a lot more out there than you might see. So this is, you know, even just still in the near infrared, um, looking at... Uh, a deep field that that appears, you know, once you're able to look through that gas and dust, and this just touches barely the capabilities of being able to look into the uh, into the infrared. So this, uh, I like this image because it it really demonstrates why we care about infrared. The other thing about infrared is that yes, we're looking at infrared light. Yes, we're looking at those longer wavelengths of light. But really, we're looking at visible light as well because of redshift. And that's what is really exciting about Webb and uh, being able to see farther back in time. Because as the universe expands, it's going to stretch that visible light out. If we're not looking at infrared, we're missing a lot of what is available to us uh, that is very, very, very old um, old light waves. So the the number that I've heard uh, is a, a couple of million years, let's say uh, for a round number, let's say 300, 400, uh, maybe 500 million years after the Big Bang is about how far back we think we're going to be able to see. And it, we're not going to be able to go back much more than that. Uh, because when you look at the cosmology of the early, early, early universe, um, Everything was very compact. Everything was very uh, densely packed, and light's not going to make it out. So we've got to get to that point in the history of the universe where light starts to be able to get out. And we're already seeing almost that far back. So, uh, yes, we're seeing some really incredible numbers about how far back some of these images are. That's going to slow down a bit over um, Webb's lifetime. I'll talk a bit about how the, the engineering here has extended Webb's lifetime too. So you know, keep me honest on that. Let me show you one more kind of collection of, of telescope, uh, space telescopes uh, uh, up against those, those spectrums. And I'll, I'll pause for some, some thoughts and, and questions and such. But you know, how many of these have you heard of before? How many of these uh, have you seen images or other data from before? Hubble's right there in the middle. It's right there in the visible. Uh, Webb is a little bit farther into the infrared. Spitzer has is, is produced some amazing things. Uh, but you know, we've got you know, quite a number of space telescopes up there. This is actually just a sampling. Um, 
they're all designed to do very, very specific things, to, to look in specific parts of, of the spectrum. And you bring all that data together, and then you've got a, a broader view of the, the, the complete elect electromagnetic spectrum. And I went ahead and threw some of the ground telescopes on here, too, because they're, they're part of this story as well. Green Bank up in West Virginia. Um, first time I drove past that that telescope, it, it just it's huge. Um, and I saw it from a great, great distance because the town around Green Bank, uh, the, the residents there agree to live in these conditions. Um, they, uh, they limit the electromagnetic radiation coming off of their homes. They limit the number of appliances and that the type of appliances they, they have. They avoid diesel engines in vehicles because they, uh, they give off radio waves that can impact the, um, uh, the observations there. So that's a pretty amazing thing. Sophia is an amazing aircraft. We took a 747, caught a hole in it, and uh, pointed a telescope out of there. One of the uh, astrophysicists here at uh, one of the museums here in Raleigh, uh, she's done a couple of campaigns on Sophia where she went up there as a visiting scientist. It's amazing because you can put it, you can put that plane wherever you need to. It's got a nice long range. They fly sorties out of Southern California as well as Christchurch, uh, New Zealand. And the neat thing about it is it's really good at looking occultations. You could park that thing in the shadow of planet or an asteroid or whatever um, that is occulting a, a star or whatever behind it and gets just some incredible data. Uh, but all these things work together. Um, so I'll pause here and, and see if there's any comments so far or, or, or questions uh, about some of this um, talk about the spectrum and where all these things fit in. And if not, I'll move on. I just wanted so, to say I put a couple of links in chat. Uh, there's uh, a, a recent uh, James Webb Space Telescope uh, deep field image. I just downloaded it. It's 31,000 by 10,000. <laughs> it's huge. And that's they're, they're just a, keep a question too. Tony, you might uh, you might be appraised that Sophia uh, was just it was just announced a couple of days ago that it's going to be retired. I saw that. Yeah, that's like an X United, and I think it flew for Japan Airways or something like that for a while. So that airframe has a lot of hours on it. I'm sure that contributed to it. But uh, yeah, I was disappointed to see that. I was hoping to fly on it sometime. Uh, they do have you know visiting science programs, but. Yeah, uh, and apparently its its mission is no longer needed. It was a partnership with um, the German Space Agency. Right, right, yeah. The DLR on there is. All right, you're about to get North Carolina out. you got to forgive me because I, I developed these slides for, um, uh, for North Carolina audiences, so we brag on Mr. Webb quite a bit, but uh, I'm, I'm happy to share his story a little bit further. Uh, especially since there's been a little bit of controversy about uh, uh, Mr. Webb and his administration. But I'd like to share a little bit about why he was selected um, as the namesake for this this telescope, and hopefully it'll make a little more sense. Uh, I, there are two missions uh, that come to mind when I think about uh, NASA missions that have been named after a person. There's this one. And then there is um, the, um, and the, as I start to brag on this guy, his, his name escapes me, um, the Parker um, Solar Mission. Uh, it was named for um, Dr. Eugene Parker, who is basically the, the father of space weather. And he, he came out with uh, some theories that were really rejected by his peers at the time, and he's basically described how solar physics works in a way that hadn't been seen before. So he was honored with that while he was living. I actually met Dr. Parker. I was at the launch, and uh, it was really neat to see all his students coming back uh, to honor him as well. So that's one. The other is James Webb. So James Webb was NASA administrator in the early 60s. So I'm sure many of you know your, your early NASA history and you know your Apollo history. Uh, he was there during the run-up to the Apollo program. Now, uh, he left NASA 
uh, right before Apollo 11 actually launched, but he is really credited. He's called the administrator's administrator. He was really good at bringing out the best in people and, and organizing these really, really complicated programs. But something he did throughout that, I mean, think back to the 60s and, and, and NASA and what was happening at the time. Everybody had moon fever. Uh, everybody was really, really focused on the space race, on the moon race, and on reaching the moon with a crew. Still, he was responsible as administrator for guiding some of the NASA budgetary uh, items and all comes down to money. We all know that, but he made sure that there was ample budget for astronomy, ample budget for science. Then we didn't dump the entire budget into the crewed spaceflight program. So that's the main reason that he was selected as the namesake for this telescope. Uh, so we like to brag on him here in North Carolina. Uh, on the left hand side, that's his yearbook picture from the University of North Carolina where he got his bachelor's degree in education. Uh, he ended up working for um, uh, a couple of technical companies after that. And that's really, really, he, he honed um, his, his skills as administrator head of the World War. Over on the right-hand side, I, I like to think I had a little bit of something to do with this road sign here. So I, I don't know if Michigan does it, but uh, here in North Carolina, many states do this. The highway department will put up history signs, history markers, and I'm sitting in a meeting at um, in downtown Raleigh uh, with the Department of Natural Resources, and we're planning the events at the local history museum. We're going to do some things at the state parks ahead of the Apollo 11 uh, anniversary. I'm trying to think of, of of engaging things we can do with the public, and I find myself sitting next to somebody at the highway department who turns out they're responsible for these signs, and I commented they just put one up. Um, in front of the planetarium here in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, where a lot of the uh, cartographical training was done um, of pretty much every crewed program from Mercury on up to the space shuttle was done in Chapel Hill. They learned how to find their, to use the sextants to um, find their way, um, you know, with, when the computers failed, which they did, uh, um, several of the Apollo 13 astronauts credit what they learned there uh, as saving their lives. But in a long story short, they put a highway marker up in front of it, noting the astronaut training there. So I'm, I'm sitting next to this person from the highway department having a conversation about that. I thought it was really cool that they, they did that compliment on it. said, uh, not for nothing, but when's Mr. Webb going to get his, um, his, his highway marker? You know, he was... He, he headed up NASA during the early 60s. And she says, I've never heard this before. I said, His name's about to get pretty big. This was several years before the launch of the telescope. I said, so uh, that might be worth looking into. She took my card. We talked a little bit after that. And then I didn't hear anything about it for, you know, a couple of years. And then I get an email and it says, we're unveiling the sign if you want to come see it. So that's what this is. This is in front of an elementary school in Oxford, North Carolina, a little bitty town in um, in northeastern North Carolina that he was from. His home is around the corner from this uh, elementary school, but they opted to put it in front of the elementary school, which I thought was great. Uh, the two people on the lower left uh, are his children uh, who were just overwhelmed by this. They, they couldn't understand why their father was getting so much attention here. And the, um, the, the plush that they're holding there is the mascot of the North Carolina Science Festival. Over on the right-hand side, that's a local historian and uh, the mayor of Oxford. So we're, we're pretty proud of, of Mr. Webb. So enough about Mr. Webb. Let's get into the, the engineering of it all. So this is a video, and I'm, I'm sure it's a little bit jerky for some of you, but uh, you'll, you'll get the idea of what's going on here. Uh, and this is where I start to brag on the engineering a little bit. So what you see right there, that, that single liquid-fueled engine, uh, this is an Ariane 5 rocket, um, that engine right there is in large part responsible for the primary mission length of the Webb telescope was set at five years. Primary missions are, are what you define success or, or failure of a mission. It's really kind of the minimal. These are the things we must get done in order to call this worthwhile. They're the minimal set of science object objectives. That engine right there, plus all of the engineering that I'm gonna show you over the next couple of minutes, is the reason that that five years has turned into 20 or more. So this, this telescope is 
It's not a NASA mission. It is truly a partnership between the European Space Agency, the Canadian Space Agency, and obviously NASA. This rocket right here is the major contribution of the European Space Agency. And we've heard some stories about that engine right there being selected. So European Space Agency had a number of engines to select from. They've all been all been tested. So the the, the ESA program manager is responsible for it, took all the data from all the, the, the test of all of those engines and picked the absolute most reliable one. Not just in, in terms of success and failure, but the one that produced the the thrust that was um, that was as close as possible to what was commanded. The one that cut on and off at the uh, uh, as close to what is commanded to give them the best performing rocket possible because there's fuel on board um, the, the web telescope. Its lifespan is limited by fuel. So if you do not ha have to use that fuel to get yourself back into that trajectory to get you to the right point at uh, Lagrange point two, and we'll see that in a moment, uh, every gram of fuel that you don't use, you can use to extend that mission. So the more accurate this is in a orbit insertion, this uh, um, this engine right here is, the more fuel you're gonna have left over because you don't have to correct for it. So long story short, it was hyper, hyper, hyper accurate and put the mission into, put the spacecraft into the best possible position to uh, for a, a nice long life. So I'll, we'll back, brag on the ESA, we'll, we'll brag on, uh, you know, NASA engineers will brag on Northrop Grumman engineers for how they put this thing together. Uh, it's just, it, the story here for me is it's an amazing engineering story. So here's another question I get from time to time. Why did we pick the Ariane 5? One answer I just gave is that was the European Space Agency's contribution to all of this. Um, but, and I kind of snarkily uh, mentioned it as I just joined, uh, Sp SpaceX fans, can often see the world as uh, the only rocket worth worrying about is is SpaceX. Um, but that's just, it is a wonderful rocket. It has done amazing things for reducing the cost of getting to orbit, but it is not always the right tool for the job. So here's a couple of numbers that I pulled from, and you can see the sources down in the lower right-hand corner. And I'm happy to share these slides if, if uh, anybody wants to, to dig into this a little bit themselves. But I pulled the numbers directly from the user guides, uh, the, the, the technical information that is provided to customers when they go to these three companies and ask for uh, launch services. So uh, what you're seeing there, those three, um, three columns describe the shape of the orbit. Uh, the inclination being that angle between you know, where the where the orbit is occurring, where the rocket is is putting that payload into orbit relationship to the equator. Um, that's that angle. Apogee and perigee are measurements of you know, how far that orbit is from uh, from the surface of the Earth. Perigee being the closer, apogee being the away, the uh, farther away. The way to remember those uh, for me is at least away starts with A, so apogee is the farther away one. But you can see the numbers here. Uh, the Ariane 5 just is the is the most accurate in putting it into orbit. Could the Falcon 9 have lifted it? No, it would have had to have been a Falcon 9 heavy. This is a very big, um, uh, very big payload. Um, the Atlas 5, mm, a, a um, actually, it would have been a Delta IV heavy uh, from United Launch Alliance that probably would have had to been used because of the extreme mass here. Um, but it's not quite as as accurate. So uh, the, the Ariane 5 was the way to go. And I'm sure I've got some rocket fans on the call. There always are rocket fans in any, uh, uh, any um, astronomy club. And you all probably over frosty beverages yourself argued about uh, various rockets. So any questions, comments before I move on with a little more of the engineering? All right, let's jump into it. I got some more pretty pictures. So uh, 
once we get it into that initial orbit, the next thing that's going to happen is spacecraft separation. So watch closely. Uh, do you see those two blocks that just uh, fell away? Uh, we'll see this on a lot of missions like this. Um, those are dead weight. Uh, they're often made of tungsten, uh, but they're basically very dense pieces of metal that are there to keep the attitude of you know the overall vehicle in a certain place. Once they're ejected, they change the center of gravity. That's basically a nice cheap way of pointing the spacecraft where you want it to go. It, it, it changes the, the attitude. Everything that you see here over the next several steps, it's going to take about a month. And keep in mind those little pieces of tungsten that just kicked off of there and how low tech that is. The solution, the best solution in aerospace is always either the simplest one or the one that has worked previously. You don't want to be getting creative when you've got a one-of-a-kind spacecraft up there. Uh, so keep that in mind as we see things. So now we're separated. Uh, we've gotten rid of that, uh, that third stage. And now the spacecraft is on its own. It has a single engine. Keep that in mind, too. It is not a very powerful engine. So most of the Delta V, most of that oomph, that it's going to take to get to um, get to that Lagrange point two, where it is essentially in, in orbit right now, where it's going to stay for its lifespan, uh, came from what the the Arian gave it, and you know a couple of midpoint corrections. That one engine is pointing back at Earth. It is not pointing in the opposite direction. So. What that means is all these calculations, all these mid -cor course corrections and everything have to be right on. If you overshoot your, your target of, of L2 million miles away, uh, you continue on out in space and the mission is lost. So keep that in mind as all this stuff is happening. Everything has to happen perfectly. So far, so good. We're, we're separated uh, and we're just we're a, a free floating spacecraft now with the delta v that was provided by the um provided by the arian so next thing you got to do is get some power uh it is at this point running on battery it was last those batteries were last charged while it was on the ground and actually that power is removed several hours before launch so it was very very important to get the solar panels out and start getting those batteries recharged uh, that power is there to run all the computers. It's there to run the guidance systems. More importantly, it's there to, to power the radios. And the next thing that happens is that one mid-course correction burn. So we're 13 hours after launch. So this is still Christmas Day. This launched, I want to say it was about 7 o'clock in the morning, Eastern Time, Christmas Day. I was the first one up in the house. Um, my, my son hasn't gotten up that early in a long, long time. So the days of getting up super early on, on Christmas morning are, are over for us. I was the first one up to watch this, uh, very short mid correction burn. Um, next thing that's got to happen is, is the antenna. There was a low gain antenna that was automatically deployed. Uh, this is the first thing that was commanded by the ground. Everything you saw previously, that was all fully automated. From here on out, this is all being commanded from the ground. And it's uh, uh, mission control for this mission is uh, the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, a lot of association with the Applied Physics Laboratory there outside of Baltimore as well, all being commanded from there. That's a little bit different from some of the other missions you might be familiar with, NASA missions, uh, such as the, the robotic ones going to Mars. Quite a bit of stuff there is... Uh, completely automated because it has to be because Mars is so much farther away and we're talking 15, 20 or more, more light minutes away. This is still just a couple of light seconds away. We're able to do some of these these commands and because of the uh, the complexity here and because of um, this being a one of one of a kind instrument, they wanted to be able to command it manually. Uh, check everything out before they moved on to the next step. So we're two days in, we've got our, our antenna out, we've got good communications with the spacecraft. But if you look here, it doesn't look much like a telescope. You can see some things that are starting to look that way, but um, 
we've still got a lot of unfolding to do. So let's get started with that. Very first thing that needs to happen is we need to deploy those pallets. There's one in the front, there's one in the back. This pallet contains the sunshade. So the sunshade is there to block solar energy because it is actually very, very hot in space, believe it or not. And we need it to be very, very cold. We got to block that solar energy um, to be able to reduce the temperature on the instruments, particularly those infrared ones that need to operate at close to absolute zero. We'll see some of those numbers in a moment. So at this point, we've just deployed these things and we're ready to start unfurling that solar shade. What you just saw there was one of the few motions uh, during the unfurling space, during the unfolding uh, phase that um, was motor driven. For the most part, it's a lot of stored energy. It's a lot of springs that are being commanded open through explosive bolts. It's a lot of wound up um, cables and things like that, that are again being released through explosive bolts. And that technology has been around for a long, long time. It was used a lot during the Apollo program. It's very, very reliable. You take a bolt that's got uh, some explosive material in it, you apply a charge across it, and you can cause that bolt to break in whatever place you want. It's the same way that we um, uh, will we'll rob a rocket of thrust uh, if we need to destroy it for whatever reason, if it's... Uh, um, going off course or whatever, same kind of idea. And that is really, really reliable in large part because it has been used for decades in the military. Uh, that's how um, missiles, that's how um, bombs and, and, and other ordnance are attached to aircraft. Uh, there's an explosive bolt that um, steers in the right place and releases that ordnance. So that's been tried over and over and over again. We'll use that experience. We'll use that that testing here in space uh, because we know it'll work, and it absolutely did work. So next thing we need to do is we need to give ourselves some clearance. We're going to raise that tower, and that tower contains all of the sensors, all of the cameras, all of those instruments that are going to be used to gather that light and, and produce those wonderful pictures that we're starting to see. But it also gives us some clearance to start unfurling that um, unfurling that shade that we'll see in a moment. This is a trim tab, and maybe there's a, a sailor on a call that can tell me a little bit about what a trim tab is used in a sailboat, because that's the uh, comparison that I've seen. This is basically there to keep the telescope pointed in the right direction um, without using any fuel. Uh, it's taking advantage of the solar winds. Are there any sailors on the call? Okay. Well, it's we'll pretty much on. the same thing they did with the K2 mission. There you go. Solar yeah. wind. Yeah. And you know, solar wind can be used for for propulsion, you know, nice big sail, or it can be used as a, um, it's kind of acting like a keel here, uh, keeping it in the right direction. Uh, solar wind's not got a lot of pressure to it. But again, this thing's going to sit there for 20 years. So every little bit helps. So now it's time to start getting this sunshade out. So we got to release the, the covers pull these restraints on it, and expose the fabric. Uh, so the the way to think of this fabric in the sunshade is, you know, it's not the same material. It's got a Kevlar component to it as well. Uh, but it's a lot like parachutes in that it has a ripstop component to it. Because we know, and it's already happened, that there's micrometeoroids out there that are going to be pelting this thing for decades. And the last thing we want to do is have a hole punch through it, which is bad enough because it's going to, you know, impact the uh, the thermal properties here. It's not going to be able to be the insulator it was designed to be. The last thing we want to do is have a, a hole opened up and, and ripped. So this has a rip stop in it that prevents the um, that hole from getting any bigger. So now it's time to start deploying the sunshade. So now we're starting to see some of that stored energy. So that's one of those. Um, coiled, um, uh, spring-loaded, uh, 
cables that are, are, are coiled around a center that has been released to be able to extend this thing out. And it's dragging the sunshade out with it. There's five layers of that material here, and you'll see those expand out. If you've ever done any insulation in your home, you know you got to have some gaps in there uh, to properly uh, have the insulation do its job. And that's, those gaps are starting to open up here, but here we tension it. Um, so that it'll really be able to, to do its job in terms of blocking that heat energy, but it's rising up those pillars to put that space in between. And the difference in temperature between the bottom layer and the top layer is hundreds of degrees. Does a really, really good job. So we're, you know, we're a, um, a week in, we got another three weeks work worth of uh, deployment to do, and we're starting to look like a telescope but we're, we're not quite there yet. We've got the sun shades deployed, they're tensioned. Uh, we can start measuring the temperatures and know that this is doing its job. So the, the back side of this, uh, the underside there where you can see that, that antenna sticking out, that's what's facing back towards Earth and also facing back towards the sun. That's the sun side. They call it the hot side and the cold side. Uh, and the, the telescope itself is you know, facing out into the, uh, the quote unquote cosmos to do its job. So you might have the question, okay, if it's facing in one direction, uh, doesn't that limit what we can look at? Well, it, it remains in that direction. It rides around at L2 as, it's, uh, as L2 moves around the, the sun throughout the year. So throughout the year, we have a, a full view out into um, you know, deep space. Let's go ahead and start making this thing look like a telescope. So the next thing that's got to happen is deploy that secondary mirror. And this should start looking for, familiar to you. I know it looks familiar to me. My um, my Dobsonian is uh, is sitting over in the corner here, and I've got a a, a three pillar spider, if you will, that's getting in the way of my images too. Uh, and if you've seen any of the uh, uh, the images that have come off of the web so far, you might have noticed the spikes and the stars. Uh, that happens for the same reason that it happens when you try to take images through your telescope. It's that spider. It's those uh, uh, those supports that are, are getting in the way of the wavelengths. Uh, and we can talk a little bit about that, too. You, it's kind of fun to count the number of spikes to the stars and compare it back to. Uh, I actually saw a post telescope. on that, mm -hmm. and somebody was describing, and they, they showed different arrays and how they affect mm -hmm. the picture. I'm going to try and find that. Yeah, look, look that up. There's eight spikes in a... Um, in a web telescope star and uh, two of them are coming from the arrangement of of these spiders here and the others are coming from the shape of those mirrors and we'll look at how those mirrors are aligned in a moment so we're 11 days in we got the, the secondary mirror out this is about the time where they were finally starting to breathe a little sigh of relief because we can do something with this now it ain't great because we haven't fully deployed the the primary mirror but we got something we got the secondary mirror locked in place and we can reflect to that um the purpose of those multiple multiple segments is is better resolution and is uh, uh is gathering more light you know, same reason that we all love to go and, and buy uh or build telescopes with larger aperture we're all you know trying to make our light buckets that much bigger same same deal with here so 11 days in let's keep going it's time to get the, the primary mirror out there. It's not just a matter of folding that thing out, but we got to be able to get it to lock in place too. So that's why this took a couple of, of days to happen. We're two weeks in and hey, looks like we got a telescope. We at least got something we can work with. Um, but it still took a couple of months beyond this before we really started to get those primary images. We'll look at why. So now it's time to get it inserted into L2. Uh, we're about a week and a half out, and there's something else happening while nothing is happening, too. Uh, we're continuing to cool this telescope down. It was launched from French Guiana for two reasons. One, that's where the European Space Agency launches Arian 5s from. That's kind of important. Um, but also, um, Guiana is a pretty nice place. Let me pause this. Oops. Um, let's let it run again. Um, Guiana is a nice place to launch rockets from because it is so close to the equator. The closer you get to the equator, that's free energy when it comes to launching a rocket. And you just think about it in terms of if you launch from the, the, the poles, 
Uh, that rotational energy is minimal. Um, if you launch from the equator, there's a lot more um, a lot more rotational energy there. The difference between where I'm sitting right now in Raleigh, North Carolina, where you're sitting and where you are in Michigan is probably 150 or so miles an hour in terms of difference in rotational energy. So that's why they launched from uh, Guiana. It's also pretty warm down there. So, you know, we, we launched in, uh, you know, 80, uh, 70, 80 degree temperatures, even during, um, even during December, we got to get rid of some of that heat energy. And that happens throughout that that time. We've got to get it down to the point where we can pull those instruments down to the um, the lowest point. So let me back that up again as I run my mouth. Um, that L2 insertion point was was pretty important. So uh, Lagrange points. Every multi-body system has them. And there's several of them, especially when you've got a, a larger body like a sun that has an influence as well. What the Lagrange points... The reason they're attractive with spacecraft is uh, we, we talk about um, gravity wells. We, we talk about um, how it's what brings things back in towards Earth or any other body. These Lagrange points are like tips of mountaintops. Uh, and to stay in that point, uh, requires a lot less fuel. As we, If we orbit around that point like you see here, we can stay at that point without falling back into that gravity well uh, with a minimal amount of energy. So Lagrange points are a pretty important place. And there's multiple spacecraft that are sitting out there. Uh, and I mentioned the, uh, the coronal mass ejection that's on its way here, actually probably passed us a, an hour or two ago. Um, there is a spacecraft called Discover that's sitting out at L1 which is between Earth and the Sun. L2 is on uh, in that line with the Earth and the Sun, but on the backside. So Webb is at L2, Discover is at L1. Great places to stick spacecraft. So here we are in the in the timeline. Just way back here, and we're still we're just barely 30 days in. We're completely deployed. Everything worked. All those springs and, and uh, exploding bolts and, and what motors were used there, um, a lot of those were single points of failure. There were not backups, but they were time-tested, uh, used them on many, many missions. So there was high confidence they were going to work. At this point, uh, a month in, we've got a deployed telescope. We're still going through this cooling period here to get those instruments down to the point where they can see infrared light uh, they need to be that very, very cold to be able to see it. And then we start into this commissioning phase. So next we're going to go into those mirrors, how we um, align them, uh, the capabilities of pointing them, and I'm going to brag on engineers a little bit more. Um, any questions, comments before I jump into um, this commissioning phase? Yeah, I, I've put some links in the chat uh, discussing uh, those spikes and Lagrange cool. points if you want to take a look at it. Awesome. So first of all, you know, let's let's get across. Space is hot, not cold, uh, especially if your spacecraft sitting there for a couple of decades. Uh, and these are numbers I pulled off of the telescope itself. All this is available on the web, uh, the web website, and you can see what the current reading coming off of it are. The hot side is reading 113 degrees Fahrenheit. And that blows people's mind. I thought space was cold. You know, all the sci-fi movies we've seen, you know, somebody gets stuck outside of a spacecraft, they turn into a popsicle. Well, no, there's a lot of solar energy out there. So we got to block it. That's the whole purpose of the um, uh, of the, the sunshades there. We need to get it down to, you know, close to 400 degrees below zero. The science instruments are rocking right around six Kelvin, with zero Kelvin being that, that absolute zero where you start to lose motion in the atoms themselves. It has to be that cold to get the kind of images that we're seeing. So how the heck do you align these mirrors and why did we create a primary mirror that's broken into all these segments? Well, one of the reasons is we needed to have them highly, highly adjustable. Learned a little something with the uh, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope, all the servicing mentions that had to go up there to correct some grinding errors with that glass. 
These are made of a, a metallic alloy. It's a honeycomb material. And I'll show you that uh, in a second. Uh, they're to save weight, uh, but they are covered in gold because gold is very, very good at reflecting infrared radiation and light it in the infrared wavelengths. The amount of gold that is on the primary mirror segments here and that, uh, that secondary uh, mirror that is you know up on the, the supports there, if you were to scrape it all off, melt it down, and compact it, be about the size of a golf ball, just to give you some idea. So let's brag on these mirror segments a little bit. So this is what the, uh, the backside looks like. And on there, um, there's a number of actuators. And the actuators can move it in the XYZ direction. Uh, each one of these mirrors can slew it, can rotate it, uh, and can also change how concex, convex or concave it is in order to get that optimal focusing uh, to get that one piece of light, that one beam of light shining in the right place. Um, they all work together. And one way to think of what each one of these segments is doing is they're kind of acting like image stacking. They are, uh, each one of these is focused on the same part of the sky and all that light's being brought together and stacked up to give us the incredible images that we see. So here's the, the bragging section. So this is, uh, I pulled this from the, um, the patent on this particular part of the mirror segment. Uh, it, it's, it, it can do so very much and is a relatively simple machine when you get right down to it. And simple's good because there's no servicing missions when it comes to this. If something in here fails, um, we will have no way of, of, of servicing it. So these have to be absolutely reliable. But the amount of adjustment that's available um, with these um, with these mechanisms is, is just amazing. It has coarse adjustment and fine adjustment, just like our telescopes do. Uh, the coarse adjustment, and this is on these individual cams here uh, that are pulling the, uh, the telescope in different directions. I'm sorry, they're pulling the, the mirror segment in different directions. 362,000 positions is what it comes down to. And that's just coarse. Within each one of those 362,000 positions, you've got another 1,300 positions. So with that, we can get it really, really finely adjusted. Uh, this will be adjusted and has been adjusted once. It may be corrected over time if there's any slippage here or any change, you know, thermal changes cause uh, something to go out of alignment. But it's not like this is going to be used to a lot to refocus the, the telescope. Uh, and each one of these three mechanisms weighs less than a pound and a half. Just an amazing piece of engineering there. And it's tested to go uh, to operate, you know, down to uh, uh, 456 degrees below zero. So this is how the commissioning went uh, as far as aiming and, and adjusting those mirrors is concerned. It shows you a little bit of the kind of movement that is, is capable with these mirrors uh, to give you kind of an idea there. But ultimately what had to happen was we took it at its deployment state and we pointed it at the star and said, okay, let's take some images. This is the first light image you're seeing right here. And they went through and identified where each one of those points of light, identify it back to that mirror segment. You can see the, the letters here um, labeled with a, uh, a clean room image. And this, this clean room here, I believe, was up at Goddard in, in Maryland. Um, but you can see right now, we don't have a very well aligned telescope. We certainly didn't expect that to be the case. So the next thing that's got to happen, we need to be able to identify which are coming from the wings. The next thing that's got to happen is we got to be able to align those in a way that you know, brings those points of light into a single point of light. And the, the diffraction pattern you see there is part of the instrument it's used to um, for that alignment piece. So the next step is, okay, we've, we've got it aligned. We've got that the images stacked appropriately. And let's start taking some images. So what you see on the left-hand side is from, from Mitzer. 
I'm sorry, from Spitzer, um, down uh, at the eight micron level um, uh, wavelength of light. So the MIRI instrument over on the right-hand side, what you're seeing there is actually the guide telescope. So I, I look at it this way. I, I think about that, uh, that crappy little telescope, that, that crappy little guide scope that comes on every telescope I've ever bought um, that I immediately take off and put something better on. Um, that's that here. So this is just the, the pointing telescope. And you can see we're already getting incredible images from it. And this is uh, kind of that first um, first light image that you know really starts to show us what it's capable of. These weren't widely distributed to the public. These were actually um, some of the first images that were created, but notice that they're monochrome. Most of them, they're black and white. All the images that it's producing are actually monochrome. Uh, the Im the the instruments can be tuned to different wavelengths of light. Something we learned with Hubble back in early days was it's such an incredible in instrument and there's so many scientists and such a high demand for time there. That sometimes we forget to take some pretty pictures with it and share it back with the public. Uh, they're going into that into web knowing that and there's time being set aside. You might have seen the uh, a couple of weeks back. This was about a month back at this point that uh, those first light images came out. Those are all image stacked, taken to different wavelengths. And oh yeah, um, none of the colors there are accurate because they're all taken in, in uh, infrared, which our eyes can't see, but you know, we'll, we'll ignore that for now. Uh, here you can see those spikes we were talking about earlier. The six spikes are coming from the hexagonal mirror, interference, waveform interference in the hexagonal mirror. And um, normally you would get three spikes coming out of the um, the spider from the, the supports on the secondary mirror. Uh, one of those is hidden, uh, but you can see the other two are, are, are coming out there as well. So I just think that's that's so cool that we're we're able to see the the physics of the telescope showing itself here. And they just it starts to look kind of cool like that. So here's another uh, couple of images from that initial sharpness check. The fine guidance sensor, again, it, that's a guide telescope, and it's just showing some in, incredible things. There are multiple, multiple instruments on board um, that are in that light path that are able to um, to, to gather um, different data and you know different imaging and different wavelengths of light. So I just give you kind of an idea there. So let's show some pretty pictures, and you you might have shown some new ones that have come out since even I put these slides together. This is the most recent one, um, the Cartwheel Galaxy. Um, that one was not a part of the big image reveal. The others I'm going to show here are, um, first of all, let me brag on one of my, my astronomer friends. You, you see this um, spiral nebula here, or the spiral galaxy here? Um, good friend of mine, an astrophysicist here in North Carolina, has a... Uh, a citizen science project that he started to do some identifications of some of these spiral galaxies. He's got this interesting theory, and I think it's born out of us being here in North Carolina and having to deal with hurricanes a lot. He's comparing spiral galaxies to hurricanes, to some of the, the structures and forms we see in, in hurricanes. So we're looking forward to seeing how that, that research comes out. Anyway, I told you I went off on tangents. So here's the, um, the Southern Ring Nebula. And it's shown both in near infrared, which is more of what Hubble was able to see. But you can see we've got even better resolution here. And then min infrared reveals even more uh, detail in there. And then um, I saw somebody had as their background the Carina Nebula. And this was just amazing, especially when you consider um, the, the scale here. That's two light years across. Down in the lower right-hand corner, the, the scale that's going on here. We've got some more of those six-pointed stars. Uh, stellar uh, nursery. Uh, that's what really excited me about the, the images that they picked, the, the targets that they pitched. They really told a nice story of, they were picked to tell, to demonstrate what the telescope was capable of. But I think they told a, a nice story because you've got a stellar nursery here. You know, here it is in a... Um, a different wavelength. We're able to see through those 
through the gas and, and dust. We're, we're farther into the mid infrared here. And then um, they picked Stefan's Quintet, which I've, I got another set of, of, let me actually go to that one first. We'll, we'll go back to this one. Stefan's Quintet was a great selection, I think, um, because this is a lot more violent. Uh, these are, are merging galaxies. They're drawn in on each other. You know, they're they're not in the same plane, of course, but they still are interacting here. So this is showing a little bit more violent side of the universe when you've got the, I guess, the kinder, gentler one with the stellar nursery uh, in that nebulae. But this one especially um, excited me because every year I write an article for our, our local NBC affiliate here, and I always tell all my meteorologist friends about this. You may have a TV station there in Michigan that does this. We definitely have one here in Raleigh that the tradition is Christmas Eve, they always run It's a Wonderful Life. If you think back to last time you saw that film, beginning of the film and then the end of the film, it's bookended by this conversation between angels. And the angels are represented in these top two galaxies here. That's Stefan's Quintet you're seeing in that film. So uh, to, to share it here in this kind of... Um, uh, this kind of resolution is just really, really exciting. I look back at the film, originally in black and white, and compare the image they used there. And I forget uh, what, you know, obviously ground-based telescope took that image. It don't look like this. Uh, this is so much uh, deeper and, you know, definitely we're able to see each one of those points of light there is is another galaxy. So there's there's tons of stars within there. Just, it amazes me. Uh, but back here, this is the the other thing uh, we think about the instruments on board um, a telescope like Webb, and in addition to imaging uh, that produces those those beautiful uh, pictures, um, there's also spectroscopy going on there that allows us to see what the, the chemical makeup of the atmospheres of some of those exoplanets are. And that's how we were able to see water in the atmosphere of the particular exoplanet they picked for that that image reveal, but we're also able to see the elements that are present in these nebulae uh, and at, at what levels. So I'll pause there. I'm hoping I have a chemist on on the call because this is definitely not my my area of expertise, but you know, I find it fascinating. Actually, Tony, we're at we're at 930 right now. Are we? OK. Yes. I told you I run my mouth until you <laughs> so does we have any questions for Tony. Please. Throw the questions at him. Oh, come on. Somebody's got to have questions. Put a pretty picture up. He was very, very complete. That's why we don't have questions. He's terrific. Great job, Tony. Really <laughs> I've done this yeah. a couple of times, so I, I apologize for ans answering no, your no. questions before you, you can ask them. You don't have to worry about that. We're, we're good. Yeah, you were terrific. I posted a uh, a link to uh, in the chat. It says, J, uh, James Webb Space Telescope's largest image to date. I downloaded it, and it's a, it's a gigantic TIFF file, and it's just galaxies everywhere. Oh, oh, they, oh, they're uh, challenging you to download it and uh, and look at all the galaxies, so that's pretty cool. What, what's the rate of photography of what they're going to do to show it to the public as they did? Because, you know, they showed just a few in the early going, and I'm just wondering when we can expect you know more of this wonderful stuff that they're doing so they know that we're watching and they know that they need to release that stuff on a regular basis so let me show you where you can go and look and yes. see for yourselves okay um what the current targets are there are actually links to so let me share this out there are links to the um the forms that these astrophysicists filed, um, their, their proposals on why they thought their proposal should be accepted because of what they were um, trying to uh, trying to study. So, web telescope for the public can answer some of the questions you just just asked, and then science planning. The mere fact is, that that's there is impressive for the public. Yeah, great. So. Um, we have an event here in Raleigh at the uh, Museum of Natural Sciences downtown. Uh, and if you're ever in the area, look me up. I'd love to give you a tour of that, uh, that facility and show you our incredible meteorite collection. But we have this event every year called um, Astronomy Days. And I'm not going to try and pronounce his, his name. It's a gentleman from 
um, the Space Telescope Science Institute. If you go and look at the, let me see if I can find those, because those are good proposals to show. Um, those first image proposals, oh. um, those were his. I okay. see. He was the one that was responsible for them. And last time he was here in Raleigh, I'm sitting across the, the table at dinner from him, you know, just absolutely begging him to to pay attention to these public uh, these public images and not just do it once, but keep them coming. And the answer I got back was, we know, we know, we know. We're not going to make the same mistakes that uh, um, Hubble did early on. So you will continue to see those. So this is, uh, it's up here. Yeah. I have to admit, uh, over the last like 10 years, I, I've been very impressed with uh, NASA's public outreach and the quality of the videos and stuff like like the, the Cassini uh, finale that won an Emmy for crazy. Yeah. So, yeah, right. yeah, so they've mm -hmm. been doing some fantastic things when it comes to public outreach. You, you name an award, those guys have won it because they just do such a fantastic job. Tony, you, you, this is a great presentation, but I have one, the most amazing thing you said there was the, the mission has been extended from five to 20 to 25 years. It might go by, as long as 25 by, and by it started some rumble. I'm sorry, by go ahead. Precision, by the precision of the, of the uh, launch motor. Yeah, the, the engineers just don't get enough credit here. And, and that's why I that wanted to highlight amazing. that. Uh, and the, the 20 to 25 may happen. Um, we're starting to hear some rumblings from NASA about sending a small mission out there that would attach itself to the telescope and provide that propulsion. Yeah. That would be the way they pull it off. Is there, did they plan for that? Is there something they can do that with? Working on it now. Uh, that's, there's a technology demonstration that uh, is, is on the books for the next couple of years. We got some time to work that out, but you know that's the idea because we're not going to want to we're not going to want to uh, uh, give this thing up when it's it's close hey, to its end of its life. There's two consumables go. there. There's there's fuel. Volunteers. There's also volunteers. <laughs> there, there's fuel and then there's cool it because we still have to um, <laughs> additionally cool those those instruments. So it will have a finite life, but it's just amazing we're gonna, the uh, that the the fuel is going to last that long. Well, thank you. Like I said, if, if anybody is on Twitter, uh, the last couple of days I have followed probably a dozen astronomers that are uh, using the, the James Webb Space Telescope. So they're they're everywhere and they're posting stuff like crazy. And, and they're all blown away by it too. And, and now that I brag on it, I can't put my finger. It is somewhere on the stsci.edu. Website and if I come across it, I'll, I'll I'll drop it in an email to you guys. But uh, great. you can read the uh, um, the upcoming schedule for the week, and I've had to go and learn a, a couple other um, a couple other ways of of, of referring to or, or labeling some of these these stars and galaxies. Uh, but you'll you'll see some old favorites in there too. I like that it's not just these obscure. Um, targets that you'll see some common ones as well, the, the kind that we we look at with our backyard telescopes. More questions. Yeah, I, saw, I saw something just today about uh, it's going to be uh, observing Europa, which is pretty darn cool. And that surprised me because the talk early on was, eh, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time. We have the capability, but we're not going to spend a whole lot of time of looking inside our solar system. This is meant as a a, a deep. Um, uh, deep object uh, mission, but yeah, hey, Europa's a, a fascinating place. There we go. Okay, so this breaks it down into, so it's broken into different cycles. This is the first cycle, um, and there's different kinds of of, uh, of proposals that can come in. These are the general proposals that come in from just any astronomer who wants to put together a proposal. Um, the Space Telescope Science Institute also retains some time for their use too. So, uh, and it's broken into exoplanets and their and their disk. Um, I'll click through on, on one of them that looks interesting. So, just a ton of things coming up. 
galaxies obviously this is going to be be a big one here's the amount of time that's devoted to um not just to exposure not just to the the imaging but the the setup and and, and all the rest of it so you can see some of them are as, as short as just a couple of hours and some of them are several several days so let's pick something okay N ngc 253 let's see what that is m82 hey i know what that is i can i can recognize a an m object but you can actually click through to the pdf and read what it is they're trying to accomplish here which you'll just get lost in this site um and, and we'll look forward to seeing these images once they come out and you know what there's email addresses here and drop them an email ask them some questions uh -huh. most, most of them love talking about this sort of thing oh boy and i'm sure some of these guys would like to give a lecture in an astronomy club so pick a particular wow. yeah pick pick a particular uh, study here that looks interesting to you know when that that data is going to be coming down give that principal investigator a couple of months to chew on it and then reach out to them and say you'd love to hear about what they were studying what they hope to learn what they've learned so far uh have them talk about this process here you know this process is probably pretty interesting too but all this is is right there publicly. That's what I really love about this. Let me put that. Um, that is just amazing. Put that URL. I'm writing yeah. a um, a Twitter bot right now to suck this information down and tweet out what the telescope is up to uh, in Ooh, real time. I was to... following that Twitter bot. Yeah. Well, let me show you my other Twitter bot. Okay. Hold on, chat. And then I'll stick this link in here. Yeah, well, one other shameless plug. Here is my other Twitter bot. Oops, that hasn't run in a while. So let's run that again. So who can tell me what they're looking at here? I follow the high rise bot. So this is sucking down, and I've switched over the years from Curiosity's data stream to um, Insight's data stream, and now to Perseverance data stream. So this is taking weather data as it comes off of, um, uh, of Perseverance. It should come at least once a day, but you know sometimes there's there's a bit of a queue when it comes to getting data off of off of Mars and weather data is not the highest priority so sometimes it takes a couple of days this is taking um temperature highs and lows it's taking atmospheric pressure and i haven't seen wind in a little while i think we, we've got a problem with one of the um or both of the wind sensors we definitely had that with curiosity it was damaged on landing we've got some good weather data or some good wind data um, from perseverance it takes those and I go and compare it to a spot on Earth. I've got a database that I pull from. And the latest database just has some fun names in there. It's Jupiter, Florida, for example. And there's you know, Mars, Kentucky, um, you know, some kind of celestial sounding uh, names. But it, uh, the idea here is what do people talk about when they have nothing else to talk about? Talk about the weather. Everybody understands the weather. Everybody understands hot and cold. So I, I wrote this as a um, like an engagement tool um, just because the weather is so much fun. And I shared this with my Met friends. When things get really slow on TV, when you know, it's one of those days where it's just the same weather it's been all the time, they'll throw on a, uh, a forecast for, for Mars. Get people thinking about that. So super happy about that. So something to notice here, obviously the cold temperatures. So the last we saw at Jezero Crater, which is where um, Perseverance is, is hanging out, um, it got down to a low of 119 below zero and then a high of about seven below zero. We rarely see it above freezing because uh, it is winter there right now. Um, Perseverance is quite a bit farther north. Curiosity was close to the um, equator. So the, the big difference we saw seasonally there was mostly around air pressure there. So um, I did it in hectopascals because it will 
align pretty closely to um, uh, millimeters of mercury that you might be familiar with. So we always have in the range of, of 110 to 120 hectopascals on Earth, under eight there, not a lot of atmosphere. So when you hear all the talk about, let's go to Mars, well, not only will the atmosphere kill you there because there's not enough oxygen to breathe, uh, but there's not enough atmosphere there to do a whole lot. It makes landing on Mars pretty challenging too. Um, there's enough that you got to deal with it when you're coming in through the atmosphere, and it's pretty useful for slowing a spacecraft down just through the, the friction in the air. But uh, building a parachute for for Mars is challenging because of this right here. There's not a whole lot of a whole lot of atmosphere to work with. I saw a recent tweet today uh, uh, suggesting that. The Perseverance rover got a software update, which gave it a 50% speed increase. They're getting a little more bold with that thing. A um, couple of the, the rover drivers that, that I've talked to over the years uh, talk about how careful they were with Curiosity. Uh, it would ride a half mile an hour, a mile an hour, and they really only they only move it when they need to move it for science campaigns. Um and they, the curiosity really got kind of hung up. Didn't make it up the mountain they were planning to make it up because it was just so much interesting to, to study down on the uh, on the crater floor. Um, but there's a lot more autonomy to perseverance, uh, and it's able to make its own decisions. It's able to move around a lot more on its own, uh, and that's really necessary again because of that light time, because of that distance. You know, being twenty to thirty minutes one way. Uh, to send any commands there, it's it's got to be able to make some of its own decisions. So, give it a little more speed. That makes some sense. Yeah, my first thought was it going, you know, just taking <laughs> off. And I'm just like, Yikes. yeah, none of that, none of that. Go catch up with that helicopter that it launched. I also saw something that the next Mars lander is going to have three helicopters, which is kind of cool. So I guess, I guess that's a proven technology. Yeah, and, and if you think about that, how the heck do you test a helicopter that is got to operate in an atmosphere that is one one hundredth the density here? And the answer lies in um, Ohio. a vacuum chamber. Well, there was some testing that went on at... Um, I uh, can't remember the name of the facility there. There is a large the, vacuum chamber the Glenn there. Glenn Research Center, is it? Thank you. Yeah, at Glenn. Um, but there's another one in Pasadena at JPL. And you know, they basically took it down to 1 100th atmosphere and tested those. those the, the, that helicopter, is, it's huge. Um, it's got counter-rotating blades, and those blades are, are absolutely massive. So if you think about the drones you got you know, running around the local park, nothing like that. <laughs> It's got to have those huge blades just to be able to move the air it needs to move. So any other questions for Tony? Wow. Like I said, spectacular. Great job, Tony. Yeah, we really thank you. appreciate, appreciate it. I can't imagine how much. I'm, I'm glad you all enjoyed that. Let me... So uh, this Twitter bot thing you have has me, has me uh, wondering if something similar could be done. I, I saw that they're planning... One of the missions to the moon is going to be to put in a network of seismometers, which is my big thumb up. And I, I would like to see that data, and this is exactly the way I'd like to see it. So, yeah, if uh, if we can find a, a reasonably solid and, and frequent data stream, that we can come up with a way to present it. Um, I, I like Twitter for its immediacy. I uh, probably ought to be looking at, at Instagram a little bit too, but um, to get the kids, because the kids love the Instagram. Um, but yeah, we can we can absolutely build the feeds. I've got multiple feeds I've put together. This is the most popular. What is it at now? Um, we got it one is more. At, well, I appreciate that. It is at... 64,400 some odd followers. It just blew up. Uh, for a little while, when you when you first joined Twitter, um, 
if you indicated you were into space, it would show Neil deGrasse Tyson, it would show SpaceX, and it would show that account. That's where a lot of the, the signups came from. But people keep people keep watching it or keep uh, looking at it, and I'll keep it running. I just put the Mars Weather Report link in chat if anybody wants to uh, cool. add another follower for Tony's uh, Twitter site. So it's running on a little Raspberry Pi under my desk. It goes out there and plays. I, that was my next necessary. question: Is what do you, is, and, and it's what what what's the uh, what's the language you're running? Python. Python. Okay. Yeah. And it it does uh, pulls the data down, does all the the conversions for Celsius and, and Fahrenheit. I got a lot of followers in India. I definitely wanted to do it in metric as well. I I contemplated showing <laughs> it only in metric. You know, because that's really what we should be running, you know, language of science and all that. But uh, it's it's still a, an engagement tool. So, oh, God, it's all imperial there as well. I mm-hmm. have to ask you, are you, you people are going to roll their eyes at me. Are you familiar with the app Kerbal Space Program? I am. And I actually, at, you know, I mentioned one of those, uh, uh, our, our yearly event at the, the museum. I found a local high school student who was really, really good at it, and I said, "Would you go run a um, uh, run a seminar for me for the younger kids to get them involved in it?" There are numerous people at JPL that play Kerbal and find it really, really accurate and really fun. I, I've got over forty three hundred hours in it, and Yikes. I've I've taught summer classes for for kids for fifth graders to doing it and. After school club, it's a fantastic app. We've got some magnet schools here in in, uh, in Raleigh that use it as part of their physics program. I I would love to see this in Michigan. I absolutely <laughs> love to see this in Michigan. Yeah, when's the last time you called up a teacher and said, "I have an idea" or "I'd like to help," and they went, "Nah, we're good." Reach out. What's the worst they can say? Gonna make me a busy man. I'm already a busy man, man. <laughs> this stuff is important, and, and more people yes, think about is. this, the uh, the more they'll respect science, and all these people vote. So, this stuff is important. All righty, well, everyone. Um, if there's no more questions for Tony, I'm going to everybody give him a round of applause and <laughs> thank you. And uh, I appreciate the invitation. This was oh. fun. This, this is a great bunch. This is, uh, I've, I've been a member of this place for, uh, what, since 2011, and they, they've been around since, for over 50 years now, so. Yeah, excellent. All right. Well, and with that, um, I'm, the official meeting is now over. I, I, I'm not sure if the live stream is going to continue going, but if you guys want to stay on and chat, you can do that <laughs> and until until the host wants to go away. Well, thank you again, guys. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run you. and hope you have clear skies. Right. Good night. Clear skies. Good skies. All right, everyone. Um, I am going to go to bed. Good night. All right. Good night, everyone. <laughs>